it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Rahul Panderipande uh, and he will speak about Abel Jacobi maps and double ramification cycles. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And there's the title. And let me see if I can get the scrolling to work. All right, so we start um, at a very basic place, which is really the beginning. So we let C be a non-singular complex algebraic curve of genus G. And we're interested at the beginning with just uh, functions. And if you can think about the function however you like as a rational algebraic function or a meromorphic function, or maybe the best way is a morphism to CP1. And as such, the most distinguishing character of the, of the function and the one that we're going to care about is its divisor, which is the multiplicities of the zeros and the poles with the minus sign. So that's a nice picture. And this is a very classical mathematics. But if we start this, we can also approach this object in a backwards way. The other way is that to start with uh, the data, let me see if I can get this thing working here. Ah. So you can start with instead the data of the zeros and poles. So these are the A's. So before they were, I had written them as uh, MI's and MI hats. So that's the zeros and the poles. But here we can start with the data of the zeros and poles as a vector of integers. So some positive, some negative. And of course they should sum to zero because the, the sum of the zeros and poles is always zero. And we pick some distinct points of the curve. So then we start backwards and we ask, does there exist a rational function from the curve to the complex numbers that satisfies that div the divisor condition? So it's exactly the backwards condition, backwards uh, question. And uh, this is, of course, a very old subject. It's a basic question in the history of algebraic geometry, and it was solved by Abel Jacobi in the 19th century. And I thought I'd just at least uh, show the picture, and then we'll go on to the modern stuff. So th that this particular chapter in the history of algebraic geometry is kind of important, that there was ideas of a divisor, Jacobian's analytic methods in algebraic geometry. And the solution is an incredibly nice solution. It says, if you want to know if there's a rational function, for example, in this case with zeros at these three points and poles at these three points. All you do is you draw these points and you pick a one cycle that has the boundary given by the zeros and poles and you draw it. I drew it here in blue. And then you choose a basis of the holomorphic differentials and you integrate. That's the whole, that's the whole solution. You integrate, you find the periods. The periods give you a point in the Jacobian. And the beautiful answer of Abel and Jacobi is that there exists a function with those precise uh, divisor if and only if the, the periods give you a, a zero point in the Jacobian. So that's a perfect gem from the 19th century. And in some sense, it's the starting point of what I'm going to talk about. And it's, of course, impossible to pr improve this, uh, this result from the 19th century. So we're not going to try to do that. All right, so that was the introduction, the classical introduction. So now we come 200 years later and we return to this question from a different point of view. So in some sense, this is the beginning of the, of the talk, but as before we start with this zero and pole data. So it's A1 to AN, that's a sequence of integers. And we have the sum condition because we're going to in the end ask about functions and we know the zeros and poles, the, uh, they add up to zero. The zero and pole orders add up to zero. But when we have returned to the subject now, we're interested not in a fixed curve, but the entire moduli space of genus G curves. So here we start with uh, this object and that's the moduli space. And since I don't have a bar on it by this, I mean the moduli space of non-singular curves. So maybe I should put the moduli space of non-singular genus G curves with N distinct markings. And then we can define an algebraic locus. And this is the algebraic locus is the solution of uh, that Abel Jacobi problem. So the locus is the, is the sub variety here in the modular space of curves. And it consists of all, I like the green better. It consists of all of the points for which the divisor given by the fixed vector A, so there's this fixed vector that we always have, this fixed vector A, the divisor given by this vector, vector A is linearly equivalent to zero. So it's exactly the locus of solutions of that Abel Jacobi problem I started with. So it's not hard to see this is an algebraic subvariety inside the moduli space of curves. And- So, uh, 
uh, Rahul, uh, yeah. does it mean that you construct a section of the universal Jacobian? Yeah, yeah, we're, co we're coming to that. We're, that that's, yeah, that's right. We will see this picture in the next. Uh, so Sasha's asking, how do I construct this variety? And, and I will do, it'll, it'll, it'll come in the next slide. Right now, I just ask you to believe it's an algebraic variety. And uh, the important point here I wanted to point out is that you expect it to be co-dimension G. And why do you expect it to be co-dimension G is because this condition of uh, being linearly quinted zero is somehow probabilistically co-dimension G because uh, you're asking for uh, the point on the Jacobian to be the zero point, and it's a, and it's a G dimensional Jacobian. Uh, and this, and this, the fact, so that's, that's some kind of uh, heuristic argument, it's got to mention G. Mathematically, it is actually true that this is always co dimension G, except in some degenerate cases, like the, the basic degenerate case is if you have uh, no points and this A is empty, then this condition trivially holds. And that's going to be actually an important case. But uh, so anyway, this is algebraic subvariety. And you expect it to be co-dimension G, and that's basically always true, except for some degenerate cases. And so then we can calculate the dimension of this, and it's just this number here, 2G minus 3 plus N. It's exactly G less than the dimension of the moduli space. So then we're going to come to what Sasha was pointing out. So we can approach this locus via abel jacobi theory. That's the classical approach to this locus. So here's the moduli space of curves without any points. And then we have the modular space of curves with points. And this mar map forgets the points. Then there's a Jacobi, and this is the Jacobian of the degree zero line bundles. It's the object that came in the uh, classical discussion and it has a zero section. It's given by the trivial bundle. And then there's the Abel Jacobi map. That's precisely the map that I discussed last in the last. Uh, in the beginning. So there's a, when I have these points, there's an Abel Jacobi map. This depends on the A. And so we have this, uh, if you want to, to, for example, if you want to prove this in algebraic subvariety, probably the simplest way is to say it's the inverse image of this Abel Jacobi map of the zero section. I think this is what Sasha was saying. So this is, uh, this is a statement for smooth curves. And if we look at this diagram and everything, it's after 200 years, actually nothing has happened. We're just thinking about the subject exactly the same way as Abel and Jacobi thought about it, except for moving the curve. But in, in some sense, really no, no difference. So this is for smooth curves. Already something slightly different happens for compact type. It's not, it's not much different. And I would say it's still in the spirit of Abel Jacobi is that, so a compact type curve is a, a curve that it, it's a nodal curve, but it's a nodal curve whose dual graph is a tree. That means that there's no loops. So an example of a curve that's not compact type would be something like that. So that's not compact type. So if I look at the moduli space of compact type curves, then the, the matters are quite similar that there's the moduli space of compact type curves. I can also put some points on it and it's a Jacobian. One has no difficulty of, uh, about line bundles on compact type curves because there are no loops. So the line bundles are determined by the uh, restrictions of the components. So- Do uh, you impose some stability? So yeah, this is, so here, this is stabi yeah, stable. Compact type curves with stability. Deline Mumford stable. So, then there is still a Jacobian, and Jacobian is this compact uh, abelian variety of vibration. And the map is everything is just the same. There's a zero section, there's the Abel Jacobi map. Um, this, is, this is one part where it's slightly different is that the Abel Jacobi map in the previous case, one way to say this Abel Jacobi map is if I have some curve with points. These are these points x1 to xn. And then I already have this vector a. How this maps to the Jacobian is it goes to the line bundle OC twisted by ai times these points xi. And this is a degree zero line bundle, so it goes to degree zero Jacobian. So that's fine. If when I'm in this compact type case, there's already little twist. In fact, this is the only twist in the story here. If I'm in the compact type case, I could have two pieces of my curve and I could have maybe x1 here and x2 here and say x3 here if we only had three points 
then I get a little slightly confused about what should be this map of the Jacobian. I can't really just do this. This is not really the right answer because well, this is not, not exactly the right answer because this Jacobian here is really the, the, the I want an abelian variety fibration. This is the uh, Jacobian that has degree zero on every component. That's maybe the better way to think about it. You have to make some choices here, but the standard choice is it's the Jacobian of line bundles or degree zero on every component. And this line bundle, of course, isn't degree zero on every component because I've, while the sum of the A's is zero, when I separate them this way, I might have some, some positive sum here and negative sum there. So there's a slight twist here. And the way you fix this is that uh, you, have, you change the, use this point to ship the degree back and forth. So if this were, if this is point Q here, then I can um, make the line bundle to be on C1 here, C2. I can make it on OC1. I can have A1 X1 plus A2 X2 plus B Q. And on the other one, I can have A3 X3 and put a minus B Q. And in this case, B is just going to be A3. So sorry, B is equal to A3. And so th there's a canonical way to twist the to twist the naive answer to get a line bundle that's degree zero on every component, and that's the double Jacobian map. And that's in some sense the only difference in the previous discussions. Uh, you don't compactify your Jacobian, do you? No, we don't have to in this case because it's a uh, compact type. In compact type, the Jacobians are already compactified. They're already compact. Ah, so there is no C star there. It's no C star. Yeah. In fact, that's the whole point. There's no C star here. In this okay. case, with a compact type, there's no C star. And uh, this Abel Jacobi map can be defined universally on the whole moduli space by this little twisting game. In fact, basically, it's obvious except for this one little twisting game. You have to ship the degree from the different components to make sure it's degree zero on every component. I, I, maybe I should have said that more clearly. That when I consider this Jacobian over compact type, it's a Jacobian is the line bundles on my curve that have degree zero on every component. That's a product that's normally just one abelian variety if the curves are irreducible, otherwise it's a product of abelian varieties. And that's a nice uh, Jacobian, that's a nice abelian variety fibration over compact type. And this MJN, you should probably think of it as, as an orbifold, right? So it's like an orbifold. Yeah, it's an orbifold, that's right, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but still that's kind of it. That's a, so this is a small twist over the classical theory is this, uh, how to fix what happens in compact type. And you can do that uniformly over all compact type curves. And uh, then you get something slightly more interesting. I mean, you get some, you can, if you're interested in the class of this solution locus, then that's the pullback under the Abel Jacobi of this uh, zero section. And if you study this theory of families of abelian varieties, the zero section here, this is a family of principally polarized abelian varieties. The, theory, the zero section is a, uh, cohomologically a power of the theta. It's theta to the G over G factorial. So the whole class of this locus is the pullback of some power of the theta divisor. And this uh, perspective was pursued by Dick Hain and uh, Sam Grushevsky and Zakharov some years ago to, under, to try to understand this class, which is what we're going to be interested in. Right, okay, so this is... Silly question. So th this this equality between classes does not hold before you take Abel Jacobi pullback, right? It doesn't hold on Jacobian itself. Am I right? But which equality? No, this uh, between, this uh, the class of the section of the zero section and one over G factorial. No, that does hold. That holds on. The, that's the that's the thing that holds on the on the family of abelian varieties. Ah, so it holds before you take Abel Jacobi. Yeah, yes, pullback. exactly. It does. It holds before, that's and you pull okay. it back, and you get the you get a okay. you get some kind of formula for this. Uh, a compact type locus. And I said, this formula was explained very nicely. I mean, it was first in a paper of Haynes and it was explained in somehow much uh, simpler way in this paper of uh, Sam Grushevsky and Zakharov. So it's a statement about universal Jacobian. Yes, it's a statement about universal yeah. Jacobian. And I would say that this this part of the theory is is we've come a little bit away from the Abel Jacobi just because of this twist and the theta divisor, but it, it's, it's uh, still not incredibly far. So then we come to the next, the, so the, the, the real departure from Abel Jacobi theory occurs when we start work, working on questions for MGN bar. So that's stable curves. 
And when we start looking at this discussion for MGN bar, I'll try to go back to this diagram here, then all of those questions that were raised a minute ago, they, they all, they're all really relevant now. The very first one is that if I take a stable curve here, then what do I mean by the Jacobian? Because then there's a, there's a Jacobian of line bundles and you can compactify it and there's C stars and it's a non-compact geometry. So that, this is where somehow the, the really new perspective is gonna to come to consider an MGN bar. But let me say a little bit about why you wanna do that first. So there's some motivations for studying this, uh, this locus. And that those motivations are going to be, I mean, the, the applications in gromov witten theory in one direction is going to require knowing this class and some integration of this class. And it's not so great to have something on this non-compact space. So here, there's a solution on this non-compact space of compact type. And when you study this cohomology theories on these non-compact spaces, you lose a lot. You lose a lot. I mean, there's the the uh, this, this, the standard discussion is that if you study cohomology classes on non-compact spaces, this is like uh, counting change in your pocket when you have a hole in your pocket. Uh, and uh, what is the co-dimension co -dimension of the complement of this uh, compact type locus? Uh, it's exactly one, it's co-dimension one. So the complement, the ah. compact type locus, the, the co-dimension, the, the comp yeah. let me write it somewhere if I can Isn't find some point. To, if G is equal to ah. one, then, then ah. you cannot generate. Ah. Yeah, so the, the equation. One, one of the components you look at of the, the boundary divisor is not of compact type, right? Exactly, yeah. So the moduli space of curves is equal, set theoretically, to the compact type. And then there's what's usually called delta naught. And so these are the uh, uh, curves with a self node. The closure of the locus of curves with self node. So closure of curves with a self node. So that, that looks like this. And those curves form a divisor. So it's very big, the complement. Okay, so as I said, the, the, the departure from Abel Jacobi discussion really starts when we ask this question for MGN bar. So we'd like to ask this question. What is uh, this cycle? So I've written it as a cohomological question. You can also, if you like, consider it in Chow. But what is this cycle class uh, on the moduli space of curves of uh, this locus, this locus of solutions to the Abel Jacobi problem? And I write this question in quotes because it doesn't really make sense. So it's, this is not a well-defined question. And why, is it, why it's not well-defined is because I haven't told you what this ZGA is. It's not clear what that is. And here we, we can look and see a little bit what. So I said in the, and this is a compact type example. And I said that, so we have to figure out what does, what does such an equation, could that mean here? And I gave, I gave an answer to that. For in the compact type, it means you use this, the node point and you, shift this uh, node degree on one side and the other side. And this equation means an equation on this side and an equation on that side. And that's, that's all fine in the compact type case. That's a good answer in terms of twists. But you could ask, what does it mean here? If I have this, that, uh, sorry, I think I probably need one more. Let's make it here. <laughs> there. What does it mean here? Why this is different is because when I twist, so the idea is that when I consider these twists, I have to twist by the entire component of the curve because I want to do that universally in a family. And if I twist by the entire component of this curve, I'm only shifting the, the degrees by uh, um, something that's zero mod three. And since I start with something that's two on this side and, and minus two on that side, I can never, no matter how I twist this, I'm not going to get um, a something that's uh, zero on both sides. So th this kind of naive answer in terms of twisting doesn't work here. And, I'm uh, sorry, can we go super naive and just take the closure? What happens? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. So you could just take the closure. And so that this was in some sense explored for some time. And that's a, when you, if you, if you just take the closure, you get something that's uh, like the space of admissible covers. It's an interesting space. It's related to the, uh, 
regularized answer I'm going to tell you now. Uh, but it's not, in some sense, the, uh, the correct answer to this question. And the various ways to say why that's not the correct answer to this question is it's not what happens. It's not the, the, the rubber contribution in gromov witten theory. It's not the, what comes from resolving the Abel-Jacobi map. Uh, it's not what, happen, what, what is natural in logarithmic geometry. It is the, it is, it's correct. It's the, it is the most naive answer, and it's related. But um, it, it's not the correct answer in the situation. We will consider another case where the closure is, the, is in some sense closer to being correct. And that's when we look at uh, differentials. And philosophically why, as you look at holomorphic differentials and things like that, the closure becomes a better object is because the, that those line bundles become more and more positive. We're talking here about the line bundle zero, which is not positive. In another way to say it is that this problem, ha there are things that live in the boundary that, uh, are in the geometry of that Abel Jacobi map. I'll, I'll try to explain a little point later, but that's a very good question. So th that's a that's a naive answer. One could say one could take the closure, and uh, it's not the right correct answer here. If you change that answer to saying, well, maybe I should take the closure in um, in some. Uh, in some fancier sense in terms of uh, in the versal deformation space of the Picard stack or something like that, then that answer becomes correct again. And uh, hopefully I'll make some comment about it at the end of the talk about that. But the, literally the, the closure here is not, is not really a very good thing. Okay, so, so then there's some, some guiding questions. So we'll come back to the definition in a second. So, so the guiding questions I want to talk about today is the first one is to define and calculate uh, this class. And uh, this, there are lots of different approaches to this, uh, this cycle class that has to do with these, this problems we were just discussing in the last slide. And there are three basic approaches. One comes, the, this, it was, the subject can be found in gromov witten theory, and this leads to a definition of the cycle class via sta stable maps and the virtual class of stable maps. And that leads to some particular definition. And one of the things that's been interesting in the past years, that was the first one. So maybe I should say that this is the first path. First path. And this is maybe 20 years old by now. But one of the interesting things that's happened in more recent years is that different people have also uh, found their own perspective in the subject. One is by looking at the whole problem in terms of log geometry. This is actually very close to gromov witten theory. But anyway, this gives the same, the same class. And further away and maybe closer to the classical origins is to look at resolutions of the abel jacobi map. So this is, maybe this is really the, in some sense, the easiest way to explain why the closure is not the right answer. You could come back to this picture here and, uh, let me try to get rid of some of the excess now. <laughs> there must be a better way to do this, but I'm just gonna, I'm just going to erase it. So if we look at this diagram, and we can just say, all right, I just wanna just try to make this a stable curve and make this stable curve. And then I have to, the first thing I have to think, so the forgetful map is fine. Now the, there's a question about what do I do about this Jacobian? And so it's, uh, um, so here one has to make some kind of choice in life, whether you want to go for compactified Jacobians or uh, stay with line bundles. So let's just stay here with line bundles. So this is a Jacobian, it's a, this is a Jacobian, really I mean Jacobian of line bundles. So it's not compact. And then I have a problem with this Abel Jacobi map about how I want to, uh, how I want to, to map it here. And so if I say, it's, you could say Jacobians of line bundle say it's degree zero on every component, then this Abel Jacobi map, I can't fully define it. It becomes a rational map because of the problems we discussed before. I can't, I can't use the twist to, to undo the problem. So I get some kind of rational map. And so a, a very natural approach is that, okay, let's try to blow the space up. 
and then try to extend this map. And even then I'll find that I can't fully extend this map because there's a certain non-compactness here I can't get around. But by blowing up, you can fix one of the problems, which is that you don't really care so much that this, this, whole, this whole map is a morphism because you're interested about the zero section. So you want to say, you want to, to blow up and define this map well enough so that the inverse image of the zero section is proper. So the, this has been pursued by several people, but David Holmes and uh, Marcus Wise took this perspective. That, uh, so the idea is if you blow up this space, you can't ever may have this to be an actual morphism because of the basic uh, non-properness here, but you can blow it up enough so that the intersection problem gives you some proper cycle and then you can push it forward. So that's what I mean by resolving novel Jacobi map. And when you do that, one of the theorems is you will, all of these approaches coincide. They give the exact same cycle class by of witten theory, log curves, or this classical resolution. In, per in particular, this, if you just take the closure, it will not, I mean, it will be something different. It'll be a piece of this, but not the whole thing. Okay, so to calculate this uh, class, which is defined by these approaches, I'll, I'll say something more precise about the of witten theory. To, to calculate this class is sometimes called Ilyashberg's question because it also comes up in the symplectic field theory. It comes up in the bubble contributions in symplectic field theory. And uh, it's, so this question is also is about from about 2000. Okay, so now I will start with the, this uh, Gromov witten theoretic definition of this. And it's the path that I like, it's the path, so to speak, that I also went down. So I, I'm going to take this perspective, but from this diagram here, you can really approach this subject in very different ways. It's not necessary to approach it from Gromov witten theory. You can approach it from this, from in some sense, this, uh, from the point of view of algebraic geometry, if, you're, if, you're, if your background is in the, the subject of algebraic geometry, I would say maybe even this is a more natural way because it just takes the actual construction and just does really kind of uh, the standard algebraic geometry constructions to resolve. Okay, but anyway, the way I came to the subject is by Gromov witten theory, so I'm going to explain that. It's the way, it is the way if you ask me what I feel is the most natural, it's still this thing. So the Gromov witten definition has to do with the modular space of stable maps. Stable maps are uh, some theory of mapping some varieties uh, some, from some curves to some varieties X. And in our case, the X is going to be P1, but it's going to be something called a rubber P1, which I say a little bit about. So this modular space of stable maps, uh, this parameterizes these maps from genus G curves to P1. And what this rubber says is that we have this P1 and we're always interested in the zeros and poles. So it looks like this. And we want to have maps be equivalent if they differ by some C star, C star uh, equivalence on the uh, C star scaling on the target. This is, this last point is saying, you know, we, we're interested at the beginning of the talk, we're interested in functions. Let's go back there. This is an important point. That's kind of slow. There must be a faster way to do it. Yeah, at the beginning of this talk, we're interested in functions from curves to the CP1. And as I said, you can trade the function or you can translate the function and the information of the divisor. But if you do that, you lose the C star, meaning that two functions that differ by some non-zero complex number, they have the same divisor. And what this means in somehow geometry is that if I'm interested in really in the divisor data, then what I'm really, I'm interested in functions up to that scaling here. We say two functions are the same if they differ by scaling. That, that gives you, then, then you get a perfect uh, equivalence between functions and divisors which is to say the divisor almost tells you everything about the function, but not exactly everything. It forgets that C star. So that's why we, uh, that's why in this, where are we? Oh, here. So that's why in this moduli space, we consider maps from curves to this uh, P1, but we say the maps are equivalent to differ by some scaling C star on the target. And then we have uh, zero infinity as a special points here. And we ask the ramifications there to be given by the 
vector A. So I, I drew a picture of it. So this is the ideal element of the space. This is an ideal element of this kind of the space, M, G, P1, A. So the ideal element looks like this. So that's, this is supposed to be P1, which I've drawn as some kind of sausage. Uh, and a mapping to it is a curve, the genus G curve. And of course, you know, you can't really draw this thing properly on the page, it's just the dimensions get screwed up. But anyway, here's the zero. And so there's some mark points that live above it and the uh, ramification indices should be here, the A's, A2, A3, and this is A4, A5. And maybe this is the indices over infinity come with minus signs. But anyway, this is the, this is the ideal element. It's um, some curve that maps to P1 uh, where the zeros are given over zero and the poles are given over infinity. And this is the same as the data of this function. But the interesting thing about the space is not that. The most interesting thing is what happens. Uh, Rahul. Yeah. Uh, but you don't have marked points yet, right? Yeah, so in this notation, this A is, 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 a, is telling how the ramification points look over zero and infinity. And that A, in the in this space, those things are marked. So I don't put a thing any number here. I guess you could. I mean, some people write the space. Could you could write it also like this if you want. I don't know if you like that better. But this A is telling is keeping track of ramification over zero and infinity, and all of that is marked. What happens over zero and infinity is completely marked. What happens in the middle? The mark points are never allowed to go in the middle. You could have some A zero if, you, but let us say that, that they don't go in the middle. Okay. Yeah. But so the interesting part of the space is not what I discussed. The interesting part is uh, in the, this is if I, just what I discussed is non-compact. So the general picture is what happens in the boundary and then you get this more, much more exciting pictures. So you have to choose a little bit what to do, but in, in this space, in this modular space of maps, what is permitted is that this P1 is allowed to degenerate into a chain. It can't be anything more than a chain, but just a chain. So it starts out with uh, an, just one P1 and it degenerates into a, into a chain of arbitrary length. And over each uh, P1, then we get, some, we get some picture that's similar to what was here. But what happens at zero, this chain still has a well-defined zero infinity. That's the beginning and end of the chain. And so it's still the case that the ramification, so I just put the numbers of ramification, they have to still be the same. So that is still fixed in the space. What happens in the middle can be all sorts of chaos. And why do we need this? It's because, you know, some, in, in this space, what could happen is one of these holes or something starts going to infinity. One of, the, one of these internal, aspects of this map can start going to infinity and confuse the ramification that we insist upon having at infinity. And the only way to rescue that is to have something happen in the space. And this solution is to have the points at zero infinity, so to speak, run away from the problems. And so then there's will... all sorts, of, there's all sorts of other stuff that can happen, the collapse components, et cetera. Rahul, yeah. and do you allow a component uh, to be over infinity? The whole component of the No, software. it's never allowed to be. So over infinity and zero, it has to look perfect. If I'm a little person here, over infinity is zero, I look up, it has to look perfect. Also over infinity, if I'm a little person here, when I look up, it has to look perfect. But inside there can be all sorts of chaos happening. And another place where things have to look good is if you're sitting at the node here, then there can be no collapse components. And then there's some other conditions about the ramifications have to be equal. So there are some conditions here also. I'm sorry, how, how did you find this thing formally? I mean, standard Gromov-Witten theory, you never change the target, right? That's right. So this is, this is not standard Gromov-Witten theory. This is, a, this is, I mean, this is called relative Gromov-Witten theory. But what's the generality where it exists? A specific so this, this is what? defined, so the first pass of the subject, it was defined for targets X relative to a smooth divisor. Yes. And so this thing would be where P1, relative to the point, well, some point infinity. But even that's not this, because in, also in standard gromov witten theory, you don't mod out by some equivalence on the target, some automorphism on the target. You don't yeah, do that. So you, can, you can take, take but, it. But, but you, take, you, you take some kind of sub-variety of this, uh, 
this relative going with and through. So this space is actually a, a, a subspace of this relative space. So sometimes this is called rubber. And in the relative space, you also change the targets. Yeah, in the relative space, you change the target precisely by the bubbles over this. Uh -huh, so you can change uh -huh. the target by bubbling over this divisor. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so and this bubble, is a special it, case. like P1 bundle or something. Yeah, that, then this would be some P1 bundle, which had to do with the normal bundle, this divisor. In uh -huh. our case, it's the point it's infinity in the, in the normal bundle is trivial. So these are just, the data is just, uh, just of these linked sausage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so this is, uh, I said, this, this subject about relative gromov witten theory and uh, the geometry of the space and the virtual class. I mean, there was a, there's kind of a community that works in that direction. And we liked it very much because it, it was how in the, in the papers, I mean, it's been a long time, like when Andre, Andre Kunkov and I solved this theory for one dimensional targets, understanding this relative space and precisely these rubber spaces was really played a big role in that theory. That's why we like it a lot. Now this, uh, this moduli space has a lot of bad features, which I tried to explain here. There's lots of, lots of contracted components and these funny bridges and it's uh, in some sense slightly hard to understand as a space, but it has a very nice feature, which it has a very good obstruction theory. It has a, it has a theory, there's a deformation theory, which is very good and that leads to a virtual fundamental class. And what's more, the virtual fundamental class, if you write this deformation theory and you write the virtual fundamental class, it's exactly of this dimension. And that's exactly the dimension we're looking for. If you remember from the very beginning that I said that this, this cycle, the Z cycle, should be co-dimension G. And the virtual fundamental class of this is precisely co-dimension G. And now there's no degenerate cases. It just, it, th this part now works perfectly. In every case, it's co-dimension G. And moreover, a piece of geometry is that this, this space maps to MGN. And now the mark points here come from A. You know, this A has this vector of data and it gives us N mark points. So it's a forgetful map. So this is, the first definition of this cycle here, I mean, historically first definition, it's defined by just taking the virtual fundamental class of this moduli space of maps and pushing it forward to the moduli space of curves. I'm sorry, this is the same question almost that Sasha asked, but how do you order the points above zero, say? Uh, that's part of the data of the map space. Uh, so you, ordering you, of the points above zero and infinity yes, is part Yes, of that's part of the okay. data of the space. You can also consider the theory where you don't order it. I mean, it's, but in the theory I'm talking about, you order them. So the, so they said, this is the first definition and the, this had this name double ramification cycle, which is somehow stuck in the subject. And why it's called the double ramification cycle is because you have this picture here, you have ramification over zero and ramification over infinity. So it's double <coughs> ramification. And I would say that maybe this was maybe not such a great, uh, name at the beginning of the subject, but it somehow stayed with us. And the usual notation is something like this, dr for double ramification, g for uh, the genus, and just a, because a remembers n. Okay, so as I said, this, this can be viewed as a, the definition, I mean, some kind of regularized definition of that problem I said about what is the What's the correct way to look at this uh, Abel Jacobi problem over the whole moduli space of curves? If you want to be somehow more careful, you could say, well, why not define this, this cycle just to be the image of that? And you could do that. I mean, th this gives us, I mean, this is, a, this is a solution on the level of, I mean, a cohomological solution or a Chow solution. If you want to actually set the right solution, you could just take the image of this. And if you look at that image, you'll find that what that image has is of course it has the closure as we discussed before, the closure of the locus that we're all happy with, but it also has uh, a lot of stuff happening uh, in the boundary. And moreover, some of the things that are happening in the boundary are too big dimension. It'll be dimensions that are bigger than, uh, so co-dimensions less than G, you'll find that also. So this is an interesting thing to look at this image. So maybe the right way to think about this is that this, this cycle I mean, the set theoretically, it should be more or less this image. And the actual answer of the cycle is, is, is some kind of, this, this cycle is supported on that image, but supported in some kind of slightly interesting way. 
OK, but this gives a pre precise mathematical question. The ma precise mathematical question is precisely to calculate this class. So that's the first question. I said that we're going to think about three questions here. Right? Where is it? Yeah, so some guiding questions for the talk. The first is define and calculate uh, this, this Abel Jacobi cycle over the whole moduli space. And at least I've given you some sketch of the definition. All right, another question, and this is a question that motivated me a lot also in this. I wouldn't say maybe not so much other people, but I wanted to say it anyway. Is that there's a question that comes, if you're just don't, not interested in all of this Abel Jacobi business that I've discussed before, there's a really basic question which is if I look at the modular space of stable curves, then in, in some sense, the most important geometric bundle on it is the Hodge bundle. And it's the bundle has fiber with the Holmerk differentials over each curve. So, and this is, this is of course well-defined for also the singular curves. So it's a beautiful rank G bundle over the modular space of curves and it's just the bundle of holomorphic differentials. Uh, and we know that over the compact type locus, and this is by this compact type, I really mean inside stable curves. So it's stable compact type curves. We have the universal Jacobian as we discussed, and that gives us a map from compact type to principally polarized abelian varieties. We just take the universal Jacobian. And it's a basic fact that this Hodge bundle uh, is pulled back from abelian varieties on the compact type locus. And that's just because when you make the abelian variety, you use this, you use this vector space or it's dual. So this is one of the, the, one of the most basic facts about the geometry of uh, curves is that on the compact type locus, the uh, Hodge bundle, the, first of all, the compact type locus maps to the princip principally polarized abelian varieties and the Hodge bundle is pulled back. And there's a consequence of this happening. There's a consequence of this uh, is um, given by a, a really basic uh, Grothendieck Grimond rock calculation. And that says that the top churn class of the Hodge bundle, well, it's the, the Grothendieck Grimond rock calculation shows that the top churn class is zero on, on abelian varieties. And if I pull this back, it says that the top churn class is zero. on the compact type. And if I say that another way, it says that the top churn class, this lambda G is supported on this delta naught. So this is, this is a, a fact that's been known for a very long time. And if you're interested in this, this growth and degree one rock calculation, it's uh, this, this the, the whole perspective of this abelian uh, varieties uh, study is, uh, you could look at this paper by uh, Herard Bender here. And it's, it's from, I mean, it's also a pretty long time ago. It's in this Dutch intercity volume. Anyway, he talks, he explains about cycles on the modular space of healing varieties, and he explains this calculation, which is a very simple one. Anyway. But, but this is the equality on, on a non-compact modular space, right? That's right. So this, this equality is zero on a non-compact modular space. And that, but this zero gives you zero on this non-compact modular space, but it gives you zero in chow. And if you have zero in chow on a non-compact modular space, it means that when I go to the compact modular space, that the class is supported on what I've put in, right? So it says that the actual top churn class on the compact modular space is supported on this locus of, cur of, of curves with a non-disconnecting node. Do you accept that? And uh, the question that was what bothered me for some years was to try to find a formula for this lambda G that it's supported on this, uh, on this delta naught. So there are various ways to write formulas for lambda G. They're all slightly unpleasant, but uh, for years we couldn't find a formula. I mean, I didn't know how to find one. And in, in some sense there was an, I remember once I gave a talk at MSRI, this was a long time ago. And the talk said that the way to find this formula, the way to find this formula is that you should take this map compact type to abelian varieties. And you know, there's lots of theories of compactifications of the modular space of principally polarized abelian varieties like second Voronoi and things like this. So you could try to compactify it. And you should pick this compactification so that this modular space of curves, this map extends. 
and then maybe write lambda g in the boundary here and pull it back. And there was at least a month where I was kind of optimistic about that, but then anyway, I failed. <laughs> I failed to make that many to really work. I mean, in some sense, one of the reasons is that these compactations are very complicated. It's, very, it's hard to see how to write down anything explicitly. Actually, Sam Grushevsky was there and, and when I told him about this, he said that it looks very, very hard and he didn't think I was gonna succeed and, and he was right actually. Okay, but that's one of the, but this, this question is somehow related to the whole story because it's about this uh, Abel Jacobi map in some sense. And, and I felt this kind of a basic ignorance. I didn't know how to do that. So that's the second question. And the third question I want to say something about is that instead of functions, we can consider differentials or K differentials or, but let's just start with differentials. And that's the more or less the same question that if I start with a vector now of zero and pole data, not that sums to zero now, that sums to two G minus two, then I can look at the locus in MGN where the, the pointed curve gives me a, uh, a line bundle that's uh, isomorphic to the canonical bundle. So another way to say it is that this data is the data of zeros and poles of, of an actual meromorphic differential. So it's, it's more or less the same style question before, before we asked about a rational function. And then we can, now we can ask about a differential. We could also go ask about a K differential. And that's more or less all you can ask about because uh, if you look at, I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna talk about all curves at once, the only line bundles are the trivial bundle and twists of the canonical. That's why they're called canonical. So the question then is to calculate uh, the cycle over MGN bar. And now the, the question that was asked before you can ask, I said, is this really right, the closure? And the answer, it, it's not exactly right. You should be doing something a little more sophisticated than the closure. That's what naturally comes up. But in this particular case, since we have the positivities, if, if K is positive, uh, the positivity in the situation uh, basically shows the translation from what you should actually do to the closure is not so serious. So actually in, in this case, the theory calculates, I said naturally something else, but it's more or less equivalent to the closure. That, that's a lot of work to show that that's the right, that the closure is the, uh, is more or less equivalent to what, I mean, I could say this more specifically, but, it, but what, what I mean is that if you go, one way to say what I'm saying with, with slightly more teeth is it says, if you go and do that procedure of um, resolving the Abel Jacobi map in this case, you will get something that's very, very much closer to the closure than what you did in the, uh, in the, in the case of the trivial line bundle. And the subject of, uh, these uh, meromorphic or holomorphic differentials has been studied a lot recently. So here, this paper, I should have written the dates of the papers, but they're, they're recent in the last few years. This paper tells you very carefully what's in the closure. That's the five, this five author paper. And this paper tells you actually what's not the closure, but that extra stuff I was talking about that in some sense should be there. And, uh, Schmidt does the same discussion for K differentials and Salvage has a study of these moduli spaces in various applications also. It's a, that's an interesting field that's been growing recently. So I wanted to say, I'll say some things about all of those things. All right, so now the point of the talk is to explain the solution to all three of these questions. And um, I wanted to just have some kind of network of some papers. So there's a paper so there's some papers that we wrote that have gotten somehow uh, in some growing de generality of studying the DR cycle. And on the right-hand side, there's some papers about differentials and K differentials. And they meet, they meet together in the, actually the paper, which is in the abstract I want to talk about. And so there's the names of the various people. So on the left-hand side, there's Felix Yanda, Aaron Pixton, and Dimitri Zwonkin on the right-hand side. There's uh, Young Han Bai, David Holmes, Johanna Schmidt and Rosa Schwartz. Also Gavi Farkas is there too. All right, so now I want to return to question one. That's the very first one, which is Eli Oshberg's question to calculate the double ramification cycle. So by now you're supposed to have, uh, have at least accepted that there is a definition of this thing. 
And now I have to tell you what, what the solution of the calculation is. And the answer is a formula conjectured by Pixton. And then it was proven some years later in this JPPZ paper. And so my next, next task is to tell you the formula. And it's expressed in terms of total logical classes. So that means that, you know, in the cohomology of this moduli space, roughly speaking, there are some classes that we know, which have to do with strata classes and some cotangent lines and some bundles. And that's called, the, those are called the total logical classes. These are classes that we know, we know, we know they exist. We know how to add and subtract them and multiply them. Uh, and then there's also, but we also know that the total logical ring is a small part of the full cohomology. There's lots of mysterious classes that we don't really know how to think about. But it's good luck here that uh, this cyclic class lives in the good part, the part we know. So I have to tell you a little bit about uh, the language we use to describe these total logical classes. And this has to do with these stable graphs. So if I have, if I have a curve, so the actual curve here is, a, is actually a holomorphic or algebraic structure. So it's kind of complicated data. It has on both sides, it has some, some algebraic structures. But then I can uh, look at said the weakest thing, which is the topological type of that curve. And the topological type of that curve is given by very little data. It's just given by this graphical data here, where I make the marked points here legs in the graph, I make the node an edge, and I keep track of the components just by vertices with their genus labels. And this is what's, what I get here is a stable graph and there's only finitely, if I fix the genus and n, there's only finitely many stable graphs, there's only finitely many topological types. So probably everyone has seen this before and sometimes it's called the dual graph. So this set is going to be important for us. So let G, uh, let G be the set of stable graphs of genus G with N marking. So as I said, this is actually a finite set. It can be big, but it's a finite set. And for every, for every stable graph, we can look at the closure of the locus of curves that have that topological type. And that gives us essentially a product of moduli spaces and we get a map to MGN. So in this case, or maybe I did it somewhere, let's see. Oh yeah, in this, in this case, this product of moduli space is the moduli space at that vertex, which is the genus and three markings and on this side with, with four markings. So in some sense, these graphs in, in the index these uh, strata classes and, they, and these are actually algebraic cycles. So they give us some cycles in MGN bar. And one can define, if you want, the total logical ring to be more or less the smallest ring that contains all of these strata classes and is compatible with push forwards and pullbacks and things like that. But really, these are the classes. Uh, but this map xi gamma may not be injective, right? It may be like double covered. Yeah, it could be double covered, right? So there could be, that because we could, like, for example, if there were, yeah, I mean, in like a graph that looks like G, I don't know, something like that, then this graph has a symmetry. And then in this case, the map is gonna be, and also it has a, okay, let's make it even simpler for ourselves. Let's just have one inch. This graph has a symmetry, a Z2 symmetry in the graph. And it, will, it means that this map will be generically two to one. And we will, at the appropriate moments, we will divide by the automorphism. Basically every formula in the subject, when you see a graph, it's going to be somehow there'll be the automorphism group of that graph there. And this factor will basically occur everywhere. And it's precisely because these maps, uh, their degree is the automorphism group of that graph. Yeah, I should say that all our questions are with Q coefficients. I mean, all our cohomology questions or cycle questions. So we don't really care so much about this. Okay, so we have to think a little bit about this total logical classes. And I said that the, main, the, the very first construction is it's more or less the fundamental class push forward here, but we can do something a bit fancier. So we can push forward, not just the fundamental class, but some cotangent lines. So 
these moduli spaces on themselves have some mark points and those mark points can be, uh, gives us cotangent line classes. And they're kind of two different flavors. There's the ones at the markings and there's cotangent lines at these half edges. Formally, half edges include the markings, but I tried to, I mean, it's probably bad to write, pedagogically bad to write it like this, but anyway. And these are all that we're gonna need. We're not, we're not even gonna need these kappas here. So the, the total logical classes that we're going to, to need are the push forwards from, from the strata classes, but not the push forward of just one. That'd be the simplest if we we're just pushing forward the fundamental class of the strata class. But we're gonna push forward some uh, cotangent line classes on that strata class, stratum class. Okay. And as I said before, the linear span of all of all such classes actually defines a total logical ring. And that's a different direction that we're not discussing really here. And you can also, of course, define this in Chow. I should say that the arguments that I'm gonna describe all work in Chow. So then something that's going to, it's, it's going to be interesting that comes here. So this was introduced by uh, Aaron Pixton when he made this conjecture. So if I take this stable graph, I'm going to consider a positive integer R and it's very mysterious what the role of this positive integer is. It's, quite, it's going to be crucial. And in the proof, um, there'll be some explanation of it but it's a very mysterious object at this point. So we're gonna take an auxiliary partial positive integer R that has nothing to do with anything I've said before. Nothing in the Abel Jacobi theory or anything is about this positive integer R, but it just comes here. And we consider a weighting mod R of this graph. So this is a very simple thing to think about. This graph has some pieces and here are the half edges. And I said that the half edges, it's, it's very, it's somehow the half edges include the markings, and actual half of edge. So in this, in this uh, example here, the half edges is well. there's one, two, three, four, five half edges for markings. And there's also this half edge and that half edge. So there'll be seven half edges in, this, in that example. So let R be a positive integer and I consider a weighting mod R of this, of this uh, graph. And this weighting is defined, this is the definition, it's a map from half edges to these numbers, zero, one to R minus one. So these numbers are actual numbers, but of course they cover the uh, residue classes mod R. And it can't, of course, can't be any weighting. I mean, it can't be any map that has some properties and the properties are very simple. In some sense, they're kind of like tropical balancing properties. The first one is the markings so if the half edge is a marking, well, the markings we already know about, the markings come from parts of A and the parts of A already has a number, AI. And in this case, this weight, this weighting on that marking has to agree with AI, but it doesn't have to agree exactly. It only has to agree mod R. It'd be a little bit unfair to ask it to agree exactly because we only have R going from zero to R minus one. Then we have the edges and the edges is just the straight balancing condition. The weights of the, of the two half edges of a single edge, they have, to be, they have to balance mod R, be zero mod R. And then if I have a vertex, then I can consider all the half edges incident to that vertex. And I ask for these also to be zero mod R. So as I said, this is, this is, this is in some sense coming from nowhere at the moment. But if I have this graph, I can consider these weightings mod R. And it, the motivation, uh, yeah, I mean, there were some motivations for why, why Aaron introduced this, but he was trying to... Rahul. Yeah. Uh, but this is precisely what you need uh, for, for this uh, extra twist. Yeah, um, it's related to the extra twist. That's correct. I would say it's more, it's not, it's not precisely. It's only part, it's... I mean, no, what... I, I, I mean, for, for instance, if your curve is of a compact type, Yes. And, uh, there is a unique marking like that's this. yeah and there's a unique there's a unique mod r here too that's right yeah but i mean it's only about r right so it's less yeah information. i mean oh, okay okay yes indeed mm -hmm. it, there is some motivation i would say that that there one of the motivations aaron had was to to try to make this dr cycle classes into a cohomological field theory and he was trying to 
And in order to do this, he needed some state space. This is related to the state space. I mean, this is a separate question about why he exactly found this. But anyway, it's the definition is quite simple. If I have this graph, I can consider all of these weightings that satisfy these properties. And of course, there's only finitely many of them because the graph's a finite object and the weightings have a finite image here. Uh, and in fact, it's very easy to count how many there are. The first exercise and try to understand this, which is a very simple exercise, the number of these weightings is exactly R to the um, Betty number of the graph. In particular, if it's a tree, in the compact type case, this is only one. Okay. So then um, this is somehow the heart of the definition. So Pixin defines some cycle classes. So he defines this class P, uh, so the genus is the genus, A is our, our ramification condition, D is a degree, and R is that auxiliary R. And it's the exactly the degree D, the cohomological degree D component of this crazy thing. So let's think about what this is. So I'm going to sum over all the graphs. More or less any healthy formula in the tautological ring involves summing over all the graphs because they're all there. And if you have a kind of healthy class, it'll be it'll populate everything. So this is if in the tautological ring, if you're dealing with some kind of actual healthy class, not some thin class that lives only in one place. This, this, uh, this summation over all uh, graphs is kind of expected. It's hard to avoid that. Then now we're going to sum over all of these weighting functions. So that's just some the auxiliary thing that has to do with R. And here is the automorphism factor, which I said is always there with the graphs. And now I'm also going to put this factor. I should say that Aaron puts this factor. And this is somehow normalizing for the number of these uh, weight functions. And then the actual meet is the total logical class, and that's the push forward from that stratum. And then I just put some things in here. So this is some exponentials at the cotangent lines. So this is a very simple thing. Uh, and then the, more, the most interesting feature of this is what happens at the edges. And at the edges uh, is, is this term here. And so one has to think about the meaning of this term. The first thing is you're not allowed to divide by cohomology classes. That's not a legal move. But if you look at the numerator, this uh, the exponential starts with one and I subtract this out. So in fact, this is a formal division. So that's legal, meaning every term in the numerator has this factor in it. So that's legal. And then here's where the weight functions come in. Sorry. That's where the weight functions come in. And this whole term is in some sense motivated by what you see in this given tall Telemann theory of uh, classification of semi-simple cohomological field theories. I, I think this played, I mean, in some sense, if you ask Darren, why did he write this formula down? There were some various motivations. Like he knew, we know the answer at that time in the compact type case. So whatever you write has to restrict correctly in compact type. And then he wanted to have some form that was a little bit like a cohomological field theory. And that somehow guided him on how to put this edge term. But however you say it, it's kind of a leap. It can't be fully motivated beforehand. So this anyway, this is just a formula. It's a, a formula that for writing a class in the tautological ring uh, that depends on the data, the genus and the A, that's good. Also the codimension, we'll later set this codimension. We, we're interested in the D equals G case, which we're interested in the codimension G. So we will do that, but this formula works for all D and there's interest in other D. But the, the, the thing that's peculiar about this formula is R. We can't have a formula that has an R in it because there's no R in the problem. So the next step is to get rid of the R. So this is a claim. Rahul. Yeah. I think uh, we should put square in AI. Oh, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Thanks. Someone's seen the formula before. The, one of the reasons this has to be a square is that you can flip all the AIs to minus AIs and that should be the same locus. So the formula has to be even in the AIs. That was Young Han probably, thanks. So the, the claim by Pixton to get rid of the R is kind of an interesting idea. It says that, he says that this is a polynomial in R for R sufficiently large, for all R sufficiently large. So if I look at this thing, it's not clear what the dependence on R is, but in fact, 
and, and, and for small r, it can be slightly chaotic, but for all r sufficiently large, it becomes a polynomial in r. And this, is, this has to do a little, um, this is proven by using these theory of, of integer counts and polytopes and the, I mean, some people are very good at this. Uh, so the claim is this is a polynomial r for all r sufficiently large. And then how to get rid of r is you let the, uh, you take the r equals zero constant term. So in some sense, you let r go to infinity, then you take the r equals zero constant term. That gets rid of the r. And that gives a class. So is that, is this movement clear? So, you know, I, I used to, if you actually do this in practice, what happens is you get some kind of Newton sums. And then when you take this, you get some kind of Newton polynomials. And then when you take the r equals zero coefficient, you get some Bernoulli number coefficients. And uh, I, sometimes I would say something like this was like some kind of zeta regularization, but uh, the, many people were unhappy with that characterization. So I've stopped saying that, but I secretly still believe it. <laughs> so the theorem, Sorry, this is falling. The, the theorem, which is, was conjectured by Aaron Pixton and is proven in this JPPZ paper, is that this DR cycle, the one we've been discussing for the whole lecture, is actually given by that exactly this formula. And it's in, in the co-dimension D equals G case. It has to be co-dimension G, but we already know it's co-dimension D. So that's kind of a wild formula. And it, in the, somehow the part that if you take this formula and you do the recipe that uh, Aaron tells you, if you do it for the compact type case, then it will not be new. It will actually specialize to what we already know happens in the compact type case. So the real interest of this formula is how it deals with uh, graphs with loops and it, does, it deals with them in a very intricate way. I'm so sorry, but if you want to compute it in practice, what do you do with R? Because you say it's, it's eventually polynomial, right? Yeah, it's that's right. So, um, yeah, but it's, as I said, the, the, right. So, so first of all, it's not a mystery. In fact, there's software that both uh, that Aaron, so there, there are some kind of uh, ways to do it if you're, uh, if kind of bit naive ways to do it. But Aaron and Don Zagi found some kind of tricks to write uh, some, some uh, fancy ways to do it. And there's software that'll do it. So the, in practice, if you want to do it, you can go use the, put in the graph and it'll just give you the answer. Uh, and, but why this works is it's, uh, you know, when you do it in a specific case, what will happen will be some small r's that are pain, but eventually for a high enough r, and you can see what that is, uh, you'll be doing things like summing squares or summing cubes or these, this kind of Newton sum problems. Uh, I don't know if that's a good answer, but the, in practice, this is actually algorithmic. It's not, you don't have to be creative to do it. If you want to do it fast, you have to be creative. So I think there is some, you know, there was some, the, the, best argue, the best way to do it now, I think is some argument that was found by Aaron and Don Zagier that's already made it into the computer programs, but maybe not made it into papers yet. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I will say a little bit about the proof, but I want to go to the second question, question two, the one that bothered me for years, is to find this formula for lambda g that's supported on delta naught. And the answer is that this, this theory does it immediately without, without even lifting a finger. In fact, it's the first case of this theory. We can look at the very first cases that have n equals zero points. The whole theory is about having zero, having poles and uh, zeros at some n points. We can just say, pretend we have no points. Then the a is the empty vector. And the geometry in that case says that this moduli space of uh, stable maps is just mg bar. The picture is this, we have zero to infinity, our curve misses them both and just maps to some point in the middle. And it doesn't matter which point because all points are equivalent up to C star. So this moduli space is just on the nose of that. And then the virtual class is exactly this. So in this dr empty, uh, drg empty case, uh, the, this DR cycle is exactly the top churn class of the Hodge bundle up to the sign, which you can neglect. So that's great. So we can just apply Pixton's formula. We can apply this formula that we've proven is correct. Rahul. Yeah. And how do you see that the virtual class is exactly this? Yeah, so that, that, that there you have to, to say what the virtual class is, but the obstructions for this constant map are, um, if I pull back the, so let's call this map F, 
if I pull back the tangent bundle of the target, in this case, P1. So in general, and one has to be a little bit careful about these when, when this bubble expands and everything, but roughly speaking, the deformation theory, if you have a map and you fix the complex structure everywhere, the deformations are given by H0 of the pullback of the tangent of the target. And the obstructions are given by H1. And this, is, this, this case, is this, there's no problem with that. If I want to find the obstructions, they're given by this H1 of the pullback of the tangent bundle of P1. But the tangent bundle P1 is just trivial here because it doesn't, this curve doesn't see P1. This is the pullback of O. So we, we're looking for H1 of the pullback of O, which is just H1 of O of the curve. And H1 of O over the curve is dual to H0 of omega C. And that's why we get, I mean, so the bundle is, so the obstruction bundle here is actually this bundle, H1 of O of C. Whenever I have such a map, I'm giving you a vector space, H1 of OC, that's the deformation space. Oh, sorry, that's the obstruction space. And if you want, in this, in this case, if I want to know what the virtual class is, I have to take the Euler class of that obstruction bundle. That's the, Euler, that's the top turn class of the, this bundle. But this bundle is just dual to the Hodge bundle. So in other words, the obstruction bundle here, in this case, is actually the Hodge bundle dual. In, in normal life, you can't, identify things so simply, but in this particular case, you can just identify everything from the definition. So it's a, so that's, that's what that is. And then we can, then, then, then the curious part is we can just apply this DR cycle formula. You just have to look and see what happens. So there's the formula and just, there's two steps. You write down the sum over, oh, I don't know, I missed it. Where did it go? Yeah, you write down the sum over all these graphs and uh, then you take this, this kind of funny R equals zero limit and you can just see what happens. And the, and the thing that you see immediately, oh yeah, so what you see is what immediately is that all the trees drop out. That the, I'll explain why in a second, but all the trees drop out and you only get things supported on delta naught. Uh, and so I, I, in the paper, we typeset some of the answers here. But of course, these are not done by hand. This is done to, to calculate the coefficients are done by software. And you can see the to coefficients look a little bit Bernoulli number-esque. You know, they have some denominators. They have pretty nice denominators. But the, the thing that's kind of magical is that it's exact, this formula exactly kills all the, all the loci that are not supported on delta naught. And why that is, is very simple. Why only graphs with loops? Because if this is an unpointed tree, if in this sum I have a tree with, with no points, then remember all, in our case, A here is the empty set, so there's no AIs. So the only solution is that that weight function is just flat out zero on all the edges. This was observed before that in the, in the tree case, there is a unique weight function. And if we have no mark points, that unique weight function is zero. So what we look in the sum that this H1, that goes to one, but the main thing is that these Ws are zero and you get one minus one is zero. And it's just the, the whole formula is zero and for all of those. So it can, so this has no contributions from the trees. So this is the very, the very first application of this formula solves this problem that, I, that bothered me for a long time. And actually it's, a, as I say, the very first application, the kind of trivial application is already non-trivial. Wasn't there a sum of Ws? I think there's a sum of Ws. Yeah, but there's, I'm saying there's only one W here. There's no other people in that sum. For sure, I'm saying the sum over two half edges is zero. I think you're missing a sum in the formula. Are they both zeros or they sum to zero over they're, every they're, edge? Oh yeah, so in the, in, so okay, in let's, here, let's yes. in general, they sum to zero, but I'm saying that that depends on what their value is, but I'm saying that actually, and for a tree with no markings, they're all identically zero. This, this, this weight function takes all half edges to zero. It's the only weight function. Ah, sorry, there are no markings I completely yeah, forgot. Yeah, no yeah, you're right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's actually a trivial observation. Okay, it solves that problem. But I was very happy to, to have this, the, the, this step. But it also shows that that theory, I mean, somehow the, the feeling is that those two problems are related because the, the difficulty in that lambda G problem was always about the self loops and the interaction with the Jacobian uh, in the self loop case. And as I said, this Pixton's formula and this DR cycle uh, business uh, is also, that that's, that goes right to that 
that point. And may, maybe now is another time to reflect upon the question about the closure. Like if you want to take the closure, like what would the closure be in this case? Hard to say what the closure would be. But you know that this is a case where it's clear that the closure is not the right. This closure z bar is not the right thing here. It's hard to say what that closure is, maybe the whole space, but anyway, it's not what it's not the problem you want to be solving. Okay, so uh, oh yeah, so may I want to say some I, some comments about the proof of this formula. So the proof, the, the main uh, part of the proof is that Aaron wrote the answer down. That helped a lot. <laughs> because then you could see a little bit from the answer he conjectured how, how to proceed. So the first observation is that if you look at this formula that he wrote, uh, it's the the shape of the answer is sim similar to a GRR calculation on this modular space of maps, this orbifold BZR. So this is uh, this GRR calculation appears in papers of Kyoto. And if you look at them, they're kind of they look a little bit similar. The answer, and in fact, they're not sim they're not the same. Meaning that if I look for R very large, these two things are not the same, but their constant terms are the same. So they're if you take the constant term over here and the constant term in Pixton's, you get the same thing. And so that says that somehow, if you follow the formula, it says that maybe there should be some geometry of this BZR in the proof. So yeah, here I say that they're not equal, they differ by higher powers of R, but they have the same constant. So that, that, so that the formula gives you a clue that you should be looking for some BZR, which is a strange thing. I would say that, you know, that's not something that you would, uh, be naturally led to. And there's a nice geometry. There's a target, there's basically a canonical target, which has both this BZR geometry and this rubber geometry. Because what, that's what we need, because the DR cycle is over here, and basically Pixon's formula is saying the answer is somehow over here. And there's a geometry where this occurs, which is a very simple geometry. You can take P1 with this relative point infinities. I mean, nowadays people like to call that the log point that has the relative gromov witten theory happening over infinity. And you have, of course, one more point in your pocket uh, up to the symmetries. You want to keep the symmetry in a second, but uh, there's two special points for P1 keeping the symmetry, the C star symmetry in the problem. So at infinity, you make this a log point, and at zero, you make it this BR point. As I said, this is a strange idea. And was when you know, we exactly are led to it by the formula. So now you have a strange target that has this log behavior at infinity and this orbifold behavior at zero. So there's a whole theory of orbifold gromov witten theory, which is relevant here. This was uh, pioneered by papers of Rouen, some early papers of Rouen. But that's used here. And then, the, then the, in some sense, the last formal step is you use this virtual localization formula, the formula for the uh, localization of the virtual fundamental class uh, in the context of this target geometry. And if you do that, and if you do that in the right way, uh, you get some localization equations that have to do with equivariant, more like e equivariant intersection theory. You get some equations in equivariant intersection theory. And if you study those equations in this limit for very large R, you can exactly prove the DR cycle formula. So those are the, ver those are the various steps. And you know, we explain them all in this paper, but conceptually the, the proof is exactly that, is to, to use the formula to see that this has something to do with BZR then you put BZR in your space and then you can use this uh, various uh, geometric equations using that BZR. And of course, the C star action, you have to keep the C star action. That's how you can use this localization formula. Okay, so that's, uh, that's more or less all I want to say about the proof. You can look at the paper if you want more details. So now we come to the third part of the talk, which is the a third question, the differentials. Rahul. Yeah. Uh, when you say that R, uh, R should be sufficiently big, do you mean just sufficiently big or sufficiently divisible? No, it's it's sufficiently big. It's all sufficiently big R. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, maybe a general question about this part. Uh, is there an a priori reason to expect that the thing would be inside the tautological ring? Or is it just because the formal is... No, yeah, I don't, you know, that's... Uh, um, so historically, there was, a, there was an earlier paper, I mean, when Aaron 
was working on this, it was already known that this DR cycle was in the tautological ring because I had written a paper 10 years early with Carol Faber that, uh, mm. that proved that the DR cycle was in the, in the tautological ring. And actually this, that paper is relevant in the sense that we use this, we use this kind of geometry. Uh -huh. we, to, in order to prove it's in the tautological ring, we used P1 with uh, infinity here and just a regular point. We didn't have the imagination to put an orbifold point there. It seemed like it'd make things more complicated to put an or or orbifold point there. We just put a regular point there. Then the localization relations told you that the uh, DR cycle was related to tautological integrals over MGN bar. So we knew that. And in some sense, that's why, in some sense, once there was this clue that there should be this uh, orbifold point, we know exactly where to put it and how to think about how to attempt proving things. Because we did study these localization relations earlier with Carol Faber. With localization respect to C star or? Yeah, C star, with C star, yes. Uh -huh. And now use the cycling group, or is it like? I mean, that we were doing the same C star, but the different, no, we're always using C star. It's just mm -hmm. that the, the target geometry is, has this uh, orbifold okay, so point. I mean, basically, if someone had told me that you should put an orbifold point there, I'd say, why do you want to do that? Is this going to make everything more complicated? And it's true, it makes everything more complicated. But the trick is that when you take this orbifold point, it makes, there's a whole giant mess that comes out of it. And it's not helpful at all. Only when you have this idea that you should look at this big limit and take right. the constant term. That's where you win, actually. The cool cyclotomic structure there is there. You know, kind yeah, of I mean, this is it just, it, it, you, you yeah. expect it's going to get worse, and it definitely gets worse. But there's just a way around it. There's a way through that path. Right. Okay, so then I wanted to, to say, I can still go, right? Is it still, should I stop, or I have some more things to stay? No, no, half an hour for sure. Okay, I, I, won't, I don't think I'll take half an hour, but I'll take some time. So differentials. So, so far we've discussed the cycle defined by this condition. That's the, the sobel jacobi theory. Oh yeah, maybe I make a point before we do that, which is kind of important that this proof, of course, this is the only proof we know. This proof uses gromov witten theory, and I would say pretty hardcore gromov witten theory. In the sense we use the gromov witten theory, the log gromov witten theory, and also orbifold gromov witten theory and the localization formulas. Uh, it's the only proof we know, and it, it really goes through really some of the central pieces of the gromov witten theory. But the actual formula, the, the thing that we prove here, it can be argued, where is it here? This, this the theorem, it can be very reasonably maintained. This has nothing to do with gromov witten theory. Because I, I told you that one of the ways to think about the class now, and a very profitable way to think about it now, is the left-hand side uh, can be obtained by resolving the double Jacobi map, if you think about that subject the right way. But anyway, this whole this whole subject, I mean, the left-hand side can be defined via more or less blow-up constructions of the double Jacobi map, and the right-hand side has also nothing to do with gromov witten theory, it's just cycles, and this equality is, uh, from this point of view, can be viewed as nothing to do with gromov witten theory. And I think it's a very interesting question whether one can find a proof of this that avoids all of that, uh, the gromov witten theory machinery. I think that's kind of interesting thing to think about. But anyway, I used to think about this as a result in gromov witten theory and more recently I've decided maybe that's not the right way to think about it. Okay, so we come to the differentials and as I said that so far in the talk we were considering this rational equivalence condition, whether a divisor is a divisor of a function. And now we'd like to consider the question about whether a divisor is a, the divisor of a um, meromorphic differential. And we would like to have some kind of parallel theory there about having some version of the formula and also calculating some classes. And there's a lot to say here. I'm not gonna say it all, but uh, the idea in the most recent paper, that's the one with these five authors that I mentioned, is to think about the problem in a, in a more general perspective, where we consider not just, in some sense, not just this kind of equation, but uh, all linear equivalences on the Picard stack. And what, what comes out of that is some, some universal calculation, and that's actually the essential thing to do. And I want to explain what this universal calculation is. So that calculation should be on the Picard stack. And this is, an, this is Picard stack pick. And we have here, uh, I'm gonna try to change the color. We have here the genus, we have the number of points. And we have one more thing, which is D, which is the degree of the line bundle. 
And what this Picard stack, uh, an object in this Picard stack is a family of pre-stable curves. And by pre-stable curve, I mean it's connected and nodal, but no stability condition. So just any, any family of connected nodal curves of genus G over any base. And by any, I mean, you know, some scheme of finite type, et cetera. So this Picard stack, an object is a, a base, a family of curves. We have the N sections. The sections are distinct in line, the smooth locus. So we don't have any confusion about the section. The sections behave properly. And we have a line bundle. That's the, that's the Picard part of the Picard stack. So that you can think of it as a moduli space of curves with mark points and line bundles. So I say, but, here, but this is a stack of infinite type, right? Because uh, yeah, but it's locally finite type. I mean, over it's true it's infinite type, but if you if I'm if I had a particular person there, it's uh, deformation space is, is I mean it's versal deformation space is finite. All I can do is smooth the nodes or uh, um, vary the line bundle. But you're right, globally I can make more and more and more and more and more nodes. No, but the number of components, I mean, it's... Yeah, it can go forever. They can be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But what is the D, D has countable number of possible values, right? So it's infinite type anyway. Yeah, also, that's also true. Yes. Yeah, nevertheless, we're going to consider it. So we, we start now with uh, data with zeros and poles, and we should ask them now to sum to D, not to zero. And we'd like to now, so in order to generalize the theory, we have to first pick a space where things are going to happen, and that's this Picard stack. And then we need to have a left-hand side and a right-hand side of the formula. The left-hand side should be some kind of DR object. Now, this, this name DR doesn't make any sense here. But nevertheless, for historical reasons, we, we want some DR object. And the place that in, in our theory where it lives is in this operational child groups of this Picard stack. So I'll say a little bit about it, but I'm not gonna say much. In the paper, there's a, a pretty careful discussion of this topic. So I want to define an operator. So I, in some sense, what I'd like to define is a cohomology class on this Picard stack. And there's different ways to think about it. Like Andrew Kresh has a theory, but that theory is a bit highbrow for us. We don't know how to, to prove theorems in that theory. So we use a, a, a slightly um, more pedestrian version of the theory, and that's to say that what is a uh, operational Chow class on this Picard stack? It, it's, a, it's a class that whenever I have a family, it operates on the Chow groups of the base. So whenever I have, it's, this, it's a class that whenever I have a family, it operates on the base. I don't know why I wrote K here. Maybe I should put here. It operates on it, it operates on the oh if it's in G maybe I should put there okay let's do that K minus G and uh, and it's it but I uh, I guess your base is, is typically non-compact right so yeah that's right the base could be anything it could be compact could be not but I think in this theory we'd like the base to be a finite type but it's it's so it's a it operates on the base and also operates compatible it, it operates com compatibly under proper push forward, flat pullback, and the Giesen morphism. So this is, this kind of theories are discussed in the context of bivariant Chow theories in Fulton's book. But this is in some sense, the, the simplest way to think about uh, some cohomology type object on the Picard stack, meaning that it's some class that whenever you have an actual family, it operates on the base. And it does that uh, compatibly. Okay, so that's uh, where, we'd like to define this DR cycle there. And we can think about what is this? So what is this event? What is the de definition of this operation? And heur heuristically, it's very simple to say what this is. That this, this class acts on the base by intersection with the locus where this equation holds. So when I look at this, uh, so when I look at this family here, this family has, line, has a line bundle moving on the, on the family and has these sections. And we, are, we have the data of A, and A gives me some numbers for these sections, some integers, and they sum up to D, so they sum up to the degree of the line bundle. So we can ask on the, on the base, we can ask for the locus where the twist of the fiber by these, uh, 
by these points and these uh, numbers, whether that's isomorphic to L or not. So the way that this, uh, the way this operational class acts on the base is heuristically by that locus. Now, unfortunately, all of the problems that we encountered before also occur here, meaning this is not a good condition. This is not a closed condition. And, and this, is, this is only at the level, some kind of heuristic level. If you want to actually define it, then you have to go by more or less one of the paths that I said before. And in the paper, we take the, the blown up the Bichow path more or less. That you, have to, you have to go by some path to regularize this problem that doesn't quite make sense. So that's kind of a long discussion and I'm not going to go through this here, but the point is that you can use those ideas to define this operational, this operational Chow class DR on, on this Picard stack. Maybe the best way to think about it as naively is by just trying to resolve the Abel Jacobi map in some universal in some in some universal context. Okay, so that's the left hand side of the formula. Oh yeah, yeah, here maybe I make this point because I've made it. The, the point of closure, this is the, the place to talk about closure. The simplest approach to defining this DR cycle is that if you have this, if you have so your family, this is explained in the paper, in the, in the five author paper, but if you take this family, if you take this family, and you embed the base in some kind of chart for this Picard stack that's a versal chart. So it's some kind of smooth, you embed this base in some kind of chart for this Picard stack, which is a versal chart, so it goes everywhere. Then I can consider, uh, then on this chart, I can take the locus of smooth curves and then take its closure, then take its closure and that will give the right answer. Meaning this question about should I take the closure? It was, it was wrong when we were doing it in, uh, in the first part of the lecture because we were not considering the problem in its full glory. But if you consider the problem with deformations of all the objects involved, including the line bundle, then taking the closure is the right answer. Maybe that's, enough, that's maybe a better way to, to say that. But it is possible to define the act, this uh, operational chow here appropriately as the, as the intersection of the closure of a certain locus. I'm not gonna say much more about it. All right, so then what's Pixton's formula in this universal situation? And so then we have to do have some more foundational discussions about how to pr properly define everything in this Picard stack. And of course, I'm not going to do that, but I will say how things change, because that's very simple. So before we had MGN bar, so this was for MGN bar, and we had stability, and we had these graphs. Now we have no stability. And, but our graphs have slightly more data also. They have the degree data on every vertex. We have not only the genus data, but also the degree data. And is there a reason that you allow pre-stable curves and you don't want just stable curves? Yeah, because I don't, I mean, I don't know what the, I, I want when I look at, uh, so, so it's true that if I want to apply it to that question about differentials, maybe I could get away with just stable curves, but actually I want to apply it to other situations in gromov witten theory where the, the domain is not in, in gromov witten theory, the domain of the curve is not a stable curve. It's the map that's stable. So there's there, I mean, there's many natural places you want to apply it where the domain of the curve need not be stable, It'll be stabilized by some auxiliary data. Okay. So it's, 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 it's a better way to go, for this, go through the subject is to not put the stability condition there. When, it, yeah, maybe I don't say apply, but there is a price, for example, this space, and this, is, this was pointed out implicitly in previous comments, is this was finite space, finite, but this is now infinite. The set is infinite because you know I would just want the sum to be the same thing. I can do anything I want, and also uh, the grass can grow. So it's a, there's a certain price to pay for it. But in fact, all those debts can be settled. So it's it's worth doing. So that's one thing that changes the graphs. The, the basically the the 
the thing that's important about the graphs is they carry some Ds. Now, now the all class. The terms, all the terms in the sum will still be finite. Yeah, this, 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 what? Yeah. Well, well, when you write down the formula. The, uh, the sum will be locally finite. The, the local. right way to say it is that when you apply it to any, any base of finite type, mm -hmm. the only finite amount of parts of the sum will, will, be, will see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, the classes, before we just had the cotangent lines, and now we have those, of course, they haven't gone away, but we have another class that comes from the line bundle. We can look at the line bundle restricted to one of the mark points, that gives me a, a class on the base, or I can take the uh, square of the line bundle and push it down. This is a little bit like the theta divisor. But it's certainly to be expected that because I have a line bundle, I get some more classes on the uh, more tautological classes using the line bundle. These are the two basic ways, by its restriction to a point or uh, it's a kind of kappa type, type class on the vertex. So that's how the, how the classes change. Then how about the, how the weightings mod R change? This is pretty simple. Well, only one part changes, which is that before we had the vertex sums to be zero and now we have the vertex sums to be the, their degree mod R. It doesn't change much. And then uh, how about Pixton's formula? Well, Pixton's formula has one new term, but otherwise, it's, well, maybe two new terms. So this is the formula before before we let we get rid of R. So it's a sum over all of these, that's infinite sum. Sum over all weightings, that's a finite sum. So as I said, this is an infinite sum, but in the way I just explained, it's actually kind of locally finite. So the operation still makes sense. So this is a finite sum. And then not much has changed here, but this is, this is a new actor from the L, and this is a new actor from the vertices, but the rest are the same. And in some sense, it has to specialize, so you can't really do much. All you can do is put some new classes with the line bundles, and that's exactly how you do it. Uh, do you need, again, to square AI? Yeah, I did. Sorry, yes. Very good. Here, you don't square, because um, this is a still a quadratic expression, because I can change the sign of the line bundle and change the sign of the divisors, and this thing will, the sign of this will be fine. Um, okay. Young Han, did I get all the co coefficients right in this? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so that's the, the main changes are these terms, besides the interpretation changes, but the main changes are just putting these two terms in there. And then there's the business about the polynomiality that behaves the same. And you take the constant term, and that's the main theorem in, in the paper by Holmes, myself, Schmidt, and Schwartz. It says that in this, you get this equality on the, uh, on the operational child groups of the Picard stack, that this is the, this is the action. Maybe we say it here, that's the action by the closure. Let's just say it that way, action by the closure. And then that's, the, that's Pixton's formula. And they're just exactly equal. And once you have this theorem, then uh, you can apply it to many different situations. And one of them is the, holomorphic differentials. So holomorphic differentials are, are uh, exactly set up for this. We take the modular space of curves, that's the base. We have the N sections and, and for the L, we use the holomorphic differ the, the, uh, differential forms, this line bundle of differentials. So, that's, so this is a universal, so this thing here, and then if we apply our theorem, it says that if you apply the left-hand side, that's this kind of geometric operator, you get this tautological class on the right-hand side. So they both operate. So here's the operation of the geometric side, the double ramification side, and here's the formula. So this, this, this whole thing on the right-hand side is just a formula. We're ready to go with this formula. I could write it out, but I don't think it's point. It's a, it's a, anyway, that's the, that's the formula in terms of tautological classes. But this is mysterious. It's not gonna help us unless we can relate this to something we know. And that's been work of Holmes and Schmidt. And here we need at least one AI less than zero. That's the strictly meromorphic case. Uh, then it says that this operation, this universal operation we've defined here, actually is the fundamental class of the space of differentials.
This is not quite the closure. That's why I said this is almost the closure. And the equivalence between that and the closure, it includes the closure and a couple other recursively determined things. So that's equivalent by more or less an upper triangular change of coordinates of the closure. So the various pages, but this gives a, this gives a, a, a solution to that question. Meaning if you want to know what the class's closure of holomorphic differentials is, is that uh, this path gives you the answer in terms of total optical classes. And again, it's, um, it's not fully theoretical. I mean, there's a, it's effective. There's a software package that Johannes wrote. And if you write uh, values that uh, um, don't require more atoms than are in the universe than, uh, or significantly less, then the computer might finish it and it'll give you the answer. I mean, it'll, it'll do lots and lots of calculations for you, the package. Uh, okay, so that's more or less what, but you, that's more or less what I wanted to say about the uh, holomorphic differentials. But the, this perspective, this perspective, very naturally answers that question. So I don't know what else I have to say. Oh yeah, I want to say a little about the proofs of this theorem. Why not? So the proof of the general theorem on the Picard stack uh, that has uh, That has a couple of steps I just wanted to say. So the idea is that after various transformations, we can uh, reduce to the case where L is sufficiently positive. So this has to do, this transformations means you do some ge geometric moves with your family and you show those geometric moves change both sides of the quality in equivalent ways. So after doing a sequence of geometric moves, we can uh, assure ourselves this L is sufficiently positive on the fibers. And once it's sufficiently positive, then I can use this L to map myself to projective space, some big projective space. And this, project, this, this map to projective space has a distinguished line bundle, of course, O of one. And you can, after further equivalences, change yourself in situation that actually is just um, a map from this curve. The universal curve is mapping to projective space and the line bundle is O of one. This isn't so surprising in the sense that, uh, in a, like a map to a line, um, it has to do with the fact that uh, CP infinity is a classifying space of uh, C star. Some sense, some sense like that. That's a, and once you have that, to those, that's actually, there's a fair amount of work in doing this, but once you have that, then you can apply, there's a paper I skipped, which is the uh, second paper with JPPZ, where we explain how to deal with the double ramification formula in the presence of a target. And so we apply the results there with the target CPN. And so it's, I think it's fair to say that some sense this universal twisted case for the universal Picard is calculated by studying this DR cycles for CPN as n goes to infinity. As I said, this is in some sense not a surprise because, because of what I said about the CPN, CP infinity being the classifying space of C star. So that's kind of the sketch of the proof there. But that paper is pretty long paper. This, uh, the paper where this is proven. This is a long paper. It's more than a hundred pages. But you have arbitrary targets there, right? Not what? just you have arbitrary targets there, right? Not just toric or something. Yeah, in in so in the JPPZ two we have arbitrary targets. That's correct. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So we don't, but we don't need it. We only need CPN. And in fact, once we have so the logic is we use the let's see where is that where is the paper where is the slide with the logic in it? Oh, sorry, I don't know how to move through this very well. There must be a better way. Ah, here, this slide. So these, these papers get somehow more general. Here is the original one just for, for the Abel-Jacobi theory of the you know, rational functions. And here we do for targets, so this becomes, uh, this specializes. And then for the Picard stack, actually this formula implies both of them by special cases. But of course we use them in the proof. So it's, you know, it's not an independent proof. But the result here, once you have that result, it, it, you can just specialize it and get the results there. And this one at the end, uh, another feature I like to think about that last formula, it was really the main result of that paper in this talk, is that it also has nothing to do with gromov witten theory in the sense that I said that you can define this kind of naturally be a closure on the versal deformation space. And this is defined just as a formula in terms of strata 
So this equality again has nothing to do with Gromov Witten theory. That should be a pick, I guess. This has this form this formula has nothing to do with Gromov Witten theory, but implicitly the proof is uses uh, that orbifold Gromov Witten theory and localization. And I I think it'd be kind of interesting to find some different approach. So this is maybe challenge. Challenge is find some different approach. Different, different approach for this for this equality. Because as as it's stated here, it really has nothing to do with stable maps or anything like that. But the, the kind of proof that we found has gone through that path. So there must be some way that doesn't, that doesn't need that. But for that different path, one has to ask yourselves, because this formula here has this R and this R limit, and this R equals there, that either you have to have some interpretation of that, which is the, the crucial step in some sense in this is, well, one of the crucial steps was the interpretation of that is, is including this orbifold target in the geometry. That in order to resolve this challenge, one has to have some understanding of how that uh, definition with respect to R is going to play a role in the classical geometry. I wish I knew that, but I don't know. Okay, so I think that's more or less all I wanted to say. Let's see, what else was there? Oh yeah, further directions. I just wanted to give one hint of a further direction. Is that now that we have this, uh, uh, Picard stack and this algebra of tautological classes given by these graphs, you could ask for what are, what is that algebra? That's kind of a, I would say some kind of object in classical algebraic geometry. You take the Picard stack of all Picard stacks and we have defined these operational Chow classes. What is their algebra? It's something like the, some tautological cohomology of Picard stack. And I don't know how to say anything really interesting about that uh, other than this, this basic result and this generality is that, uh, I don't know what that is. I'm going to ignore it. Uh, the, the, um, okay. I have to decide what to do about that phone. <laughs> Hello? I know, I'm sorry. She's not here. She's, can, can she call you back? Okay. Maybe you could send her an email. That'd be the best thing. Okay. Could you send her an email? That'd be the best thing. Okay, I'll tell her. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Bye. I'm very sorry about that, but it's my wife's office. If I don't answer the phone, I'm going to get in trouble, I think. Right? So, the, okay, so then the issue here is that uh, one result one can say is that this, uh, if I take this, if I take this formula and I use some other co-dimension here, then the answer is zero if this is bigger than G. So that's kind of an interesting result. And this, this was found in the case of DRX in a paper of by. And the argument there is similar here, but that's that already shows that there's something going on here in the structure of these classes. Okay, I think I finished now. Um, some questions? Yeah, can I? So it's maybe a stupid question, maybe naive, but so one other situation when you have finite R, then uh, which then suddenly goes to infinity using things like, I don't know, churn assignments and stuff. So you have finite level, then you have, you know, quantum group at the root of unity, but then you can take the level to infinity and you can expand near infinity. And that's a different story, which can be even done by a different method. Uh, they call it perturbative, I think. Uh, is there any, Pos possible relation between the two stories, or is it just you know like superficial similarity? Yeah, I, I don't know what happens if you. If, I mean, it is the case that you can study this theory. I mean, there's a different there's a different object here, which may be more relevant to the answer to your question. Is that that uh, if you want to study for fixed R. That's telling you something about the gromov witten theory of that uh, P1, that P1 geometry. Yeah. And you know that there's one can try to study various aspects of that gromov witten theory, right. and there are results about that. I mean, with with Andre Ukonkov a long time ago, we'd studied 
the Gromov-Witten theory of the curves, and then you can add to that Gromov-Witten theory uh, orbifold curves. And this was done, I think Paul Johnson and some other people worked on things like that. And that, that's kind of interesting direction. And that's for fixed R. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not sure it, it, it I'm not so sure this, how that's relevant to this, this formula. That's a, so to put another way, this R for you is basically a computational device in the end. So the, you don't know the meaning of it. No, I was just giving you the meaning. It's a it's a computational device. That's how it's born. But then yeah, geometrically, geometric. geometrically, there is a it, it's also plays a role in the geometry. Is that BZ? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, I mean, I think I can say it another way is that for for that geometry of the P1 with the BZR point and the log point, for every mm -hmm. fixed R, I get some linear algebra relations, which tells me roughly speaking how to compute that DR cycle, but they're all complicated. But if I put all of the Rs together, then I can do kind of linear in some, the, the most naive way of saying it is I can do linear algebra on all the all of those relations together. Uh -huh. so if I do linear algebra on all of those relations together, then it gives me a kind of simple formula for the uh -huh. for the DR cycle. And the physicists have nothing to say about all this. So this period- No, yeah, I don't, I don't think that, I think that's correct. Yes, this is not. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Okay. And another question, maybe stupid one also. So I remember that the tautological ring may be in the JN without bar. It's kind of weird. It behaves as if it were some kind of compact. Variety. Yeah. So that's that's correct. So there's there's a whole line of story there. So but the outcome has been that. So while those questions are not resolved for MG, uh, MG without bar for MG with bar, uh -huh. it's known that the tautological ring does not behave does not have Poincaré duality. Ah. So and, in and, close case, and it's expected actually for MG without bar, it also ah. does not have, com com I mean, it, it's expected that that was a coincidence for sl small genus. Ah, it's strictly so, it was, so it's not even true probably, it's just uh, competition. It's true up to, for MG without bar, it's true up to genus 23 and it's an open question for higher genus. Ah, okay. But for okay. MG with, M, well, actually specifically M220, I think. Ah, it's already. Uh, M2, well, bar, then it's known to be false. This is a paper of Dan Peterson and Ursula Tomasi. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Rahul? Yes. Uh, so uh, you uh, talked about double ramification cycles, right? Yes. Uh, can you talk about triple ramification cycles? So or multiple? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in principle, you could talk about, I mean, do they have some kind of operatic structure? So there, you can think about, so what do I want to say here? You can define, th th there is a, maybe the most natural universal thing you can define is uh, something like um, you take M, you take some curve, you can take MGN and for every N you put, uh, you know, this is confusing to say, maybe I should write it, but because there's curves going to where it, so the double ramification cycle has to do with maps to this object, zero and infinity. Mm -hmm. So we look at some curves that map to this object. You could, so this is this is basically a P1. You could have some general theory where you have any curve you want down here. And you have some points, some relative points. And then you look at curves that map like this. I don't know how to say it, but you can map to all of them or you can map, them all, map to all ones. Uh, and th this has a this ha that has a good structure. You know, you can define some kind of uh, CoFT with it. The the place where this has been studied uh, most is the case where you consider this also with uh, the local theory of curves. You take you take the target to be some curve, and you put some c cross c, and you look at maps of curves to that with all these degenerations. And this is this was proven to be more or less equivalent to the uh, gromov witten theory of the Hilbert scheme of points of this C cross C. Do but you can do all of that. I mean, the, the double ramification formula is kind of an exact formula. If you start looking for, uh, 
if you if you start having more and more complicated targets with more points, then then the theorems uh, usually go in the way of saying you can reduce the answers to that in terms of some basic things, including the double ramification formula. But if you do do this more complicated targets, you still need all those rubber bands degeneration. I mean, you can, you can decide. Yeah, I mean, if they're genus zeros and they could be rubber bands, or if they're not, they don't have to be, but you can do whatever oh. you want. But, okay, so that. that. But the, the flavor of this is that uh, once you decide on what exact target you want, uh, because what you have is we have a degeneration formula. Just say that you have here um, some, some P1 with uh, these uh, some points, then you can take the target and break it into, a, you can put one point on each, you can put one point on each one, and then the basic target will be this P1 with one point in the middle. And then there's some games about how, I mean, this is this called descendant relative correspondence to get rid of that point. Uh, in terms of some integrals. And when you get rid of that point, then you get back to the DR cycle. So there's some games you can play like this, but it's, it's the spirit is that when you do this kind of stuff, you can trade it in. You can keep changing your problem when you eventually are going to get to something like the DR cycle. The DR cycle, you can't do anything to. There's nothing to de de degenerate or there's nothing to move around. So it's, it's one of the atoms. Is there any hope to make the main formula polynomial from the very beginning? Maybe some philosophically change I mean, it? we get rid of the R in some sense. That... No, I would like to keep the R, but make make the function polynomial in R from one to nose. Not, oh, not I see, instead of finishing. eventually polynomial. I don't know, I haven't thought of it. I haven't thought about that. That's uh, not clear to me. Yeah, I didn't say, you know, it, it, when, if you look at the proof of why that thing is polynomial in R, it uses this uh, theory, I think it's called this Earhart theory about uh, uh, counting points and polytopes. And it's pretty, it's pretty basic aspect of that theory that eventually it becomes polynomial. But, but that we know also correct, right? You just compute cohomology, not just H0. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to put it in this. Uh, I mean the cohomology of the torque varieties. Yeah. 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 yeah, I don't well, know. Maybe there's some connection there. I haven't I haven't thought about it. Um other questions. Uh if not, um let us thank Rahul again.